We're Dennis and Liz, full-time RVers who have spent the past year RVing all across mainland Mexico. During our travels, we've participated in beautiful cultural celebrations, dug deep into the ancient history and culinary dishes of each region we visited, and explored Mexico's diverse geographic wonders. While we've fallen in love with the diversity of this country, the kind and generous people who live here, and the vibrant culture of each region, there are definitely challenges to RVing here. We've already shared a lot of the highs and lows about RVing Mexico in our 56 part video series, which if you haven't watched already, you definitely need to go back and watch that. But with so many of you sharing with us that our Mexico travels and our RV Mexico guide have inspired you to plan your own road trip through Mexico, we wanted to make sure that we're setting the right expectations and highlighting some of the realities of RVing through the country. So today we'll be answering some of the common questions we've received about RVing Mexico, including things like safety, rig size, fuel, and road conditions, while also making sure that you as a visitor understand some of the cultural differences and challenges of RVing here. Before we start, we want to say that we are not RV Mexico experts. We're simply sharing our experiences after traveling over 8,000 miles through 20 different Mexican states. It's also important to realize that your journey can and most likely will be very different from the one we had. But having the right expectations and being as prepared as you can before arriving will just make your trip as enjoyable as possible. In order to start your journey RVing Mexico, you have to have an RV to RV Mexico, right? So determining what rig can RV Mexico or what the best vehicle would be for this trip is crucial. Now, we personally believe smaller is better. There are plenty of people who bring travel trailers, large class A's, and fifth wheels into Mexico, but they are not going to have an easy experience, nor are you going to be able to travel to the places that you've probably seen us travel in our videos. The experience taking a larger RV is much better suited for someone who wants to maybe go to one RV park that they know can accommodate their size rig that has things like full amenities and kind of staying there for a season or for several months taking satellite trips to explore the area nearby. That's a very popular way to RV Mexico. We have friends that we were exiting Mexico with that had a fifth wheel and a truck while they were able to do it stopping at three RV parks on their journey home from Merida on one of the RV parks, they ended up pulling in and gouging a hole into the side of the fifth wheel because the entrance was just really small in relation to the space that was available to turn. It's just not good news. So, in essence, smaller is better. Even our 25-foot Class C RV had its limitations, especially when it came to width and height. I think a van or a truck camper is definitely the easiest and um, smoothest way to get around, but you can get here in bigger rigs. Just your experience traveling will be very, very different. So that brings us to the next topic, which is roads. We actually found that overall, the roads are decent throughout Mexico, especially the farther north you go. And if you're traveling on any of the toll roads, they're like any major highway that you would find in the US or Canada. Really smooth, wide lanes. Some of the routes we took, you had to go through what they call the Libre or the local free road. They're still usually pretty good like th there were some areas that were rough like they just needed to be repaved or they were undergoing construction so that made them uh, super slow and rough but they're usually only two lanes no shoulders they're super skinny and a lot of the uh, semi trucks will take the free roads so they don't have to pay the really high toll prices when you're in that situation you've got an 18 wheeler coming through taking up as much of the road as he needs it's a little scary when you're going the opposite direction to passing them. Whenever you're in the historical centers or the smaller towns, they're just not built for larger RVs. The only thing that you really, really, really need to watch out for are the topes, especially um, the farther south you get. A lot of local people were kind of will kind of put up their own tope across the the road but they're unmarked so they won't be painted there won't be a sign and if you're not paying attention to the road you will hit one of those and even if you're only doing you know 25 30 miles an hour it's gonna hurt <laughs> 
It's always good to have a plan and make sure that you understand your route, you know where you're going and that is the best and safest option possible. And following Google Maps is not always the best way to go because they're not going to take into consideration your size vehicle, if there's any road regulations that don't allow you to drive in certain places. So having an RV specific GPS is really, really helpful for navigating there. It's something that we didn't have and we wish we did. The next expectation we wanna set for you is on fuel. We have a diesel sprinter and so do a lot of you guys. And we've gotten a ton of questions about how we were able to find ULSD ultra low sulfur diesel throughout our trip in Mexico. We didn't, <laughs> uh, or at least it wasn't listed as ULSD at the pump. So it is available in Mexico, but at the same time, we don't have any resources to provide for you on how to find out which gas stations have it. So you might as well consider it a thing that's not available and then make your decision on if you wanna drive your new, newer diesel whatever down into Mexico. Pemex is Mexico's national oil brand. You can find Pemexes literally everywhere throughout the country. It's the number one gas station we filled up during our travels. And to our knowledge, they do not have ultra low sulfur diesel available there. You have a much better chance of finding ULSD at a foreign station. And if you are interested in inquiring to see if they have it when you arrive, you can ask for Ultra Baja Azufre, which is their way of saying ULSD, and they may or may not know what you're talking about, so it's not a bad thing to ask twice or to really try and make sure before they pump. Supposedly, if they do have it, it's supposed to have its own designated pump that's different from other diesel and gas station pumps, but again, we never saw it. Oh, hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. Okay, he's, we got a friend joining us. This is Oliver the lap cat who's making lots of noise in the background. Next, let's talk about RV camping. RV campgrounds in Mexico, in many ways, are very similar to campgrounds you might be familiar with in the US or Canada. A lot of them, especially established RV parks that have things like water, electricity, and grain on site, can also have additional amenities like pools or restaurants or beautiful outdoor areas to enjoy. While the amenities may seem the same, the quality of those services are often the biggest difference here. We have never seen a 50 or 30 amp electrical service in any of the RV campgrounds we've stayed at. So having an adapter is really important because you'll probably be running on 15 amp service. Additionally, the quality of the electricity like as a whole across Mexico is just kind of subpar to what we expect and know in the US. Second trip down, I made sure to buy a GB outlet tester, which is this guy right here. Basically, you just plug the outlet tester in and it'll show you with lights whether it's got a ground, if the polarity, the positive and negative wires are reversed, which that actually happens more often than you would think. And I couple that with the kilowatt EZ because this will tell me what kind of voltage is coming out of that outlet. Then I can tell if it's installed correctly and if it's strong enough to not mess up any of the electronic components inside of the RV. I know they make outlet testers that will do the job of both of these at once so you don't have to have a kilowatt EZ and the outlet tester. Um, but having both of these, in my opinion, is essential. You can also have a voltage protector for your RV. Those are a little bit more expensive, but it can save you because a lot of the voltage runs high in Mexico. And if something were to happen, which we saw some wires burn during our stay, things can get crazy with the electrical there. So it's a good idea to have an electrical kit prepared. And when it comes to drains or water, a lot of people ask about the water quality. RV parks everywhere are going to have access to water. It's just non-potable. Pretty much all of the Mexico water that comes from any public service is non-potable. It's good for taking a shower, brushing your teeth, but it's not good for drinking. So we stopped drinking water, even though we were filtering it and putting it into the tanks, we stopped drinking the spigot water throughout the entire country. You can actually buy a giant five gallon, um, what they call a garaphone, and then it's super cheap, it's like 20 pesos for five gallons of water. At, and that's literally in every town, they have an aqua purification place. You can also go to any OXO and you can trade out your Garaphone if desired. A lot of the RV parks will have Garaphones for replacements and they have water deliveries for Garaphones throughout the country so that you have safe, clean drinking water. It's not hard at all to find water as you're RVing Mexico. It's just not necessarily the water you'll be putting into your tanks. 
Now, drains. Drains are very hard to find throughout Mexico unless you're at an established RV park. So if you plan to travel frequently, especially if you're gonna be boondocking or dry camping or free camping, and you need a place to dump your tanks after a few days or weeks, depending on your rig, you'll probably need to go to an RV park, and it's a really good idea to call ahead and make sure that they have it. Drains at RV parks, even though they might be there, they might not work. <laughs> a lot of times Ask they Thomas didn't. and Stacy about that one. That's gonna be the one of the biggest hurdles. You can find places is the park all over the place but finding wastewater dumps um, is very rare and with that said a lot of RV parks will have showers um, and bathrooms for you to use so we actually defaulted to any services to wash dishes take showers or use the bathrooms that they provided now we have a composter toilet so we don't use black water so that made it a lot easier as well next up is the big topic of safety this is I'd say the number one question we received about RVing Mexico is, did we feel safe? Is it safe to RV Mexico? Is it safe to go to Mexico in general? The US media, really national outlets everywhere have painted Mexico in a very negative light over the past few decades. Cartel activity and crime has definitely increased in Mexico over that time period. And while it is a very real part of Mexico, I do not personally believe it is as widespread or as dangerous as the media makes it seem. There are definitely isolated areas or pockets that are higher risk areas for crime or interactions with the cartel. Pretty much any border town always has an increased chance of cartel activity, uh, especially on highway robberies. We've talked about that when we were crossing the border. It is a real risk. We're not trying to say that if you come here, something couldn't happen to you because it could. But from our experience, we felt very safe traveling throughout Mexico. We are in a huge Mercedes Sprinter with a scooter off the back. Everyone says, don't be flashy when you come to Mexico, look modest. We look expensive, <laughs> but despite looking expensive and being a pretty clear target, we found everyone was very excited to meet us, very welcoming. They loved that we had an RV. It's not something they see every day. And it, we didn't feel like anyone was ever trying to target us or take advantage of us. But that's our personal experience. Talk with fellow travelers and find out as you're in these RV parks if there's any areas that you should really avoid or if they've had any problems during their travels. We personally always talked with the people in our area, but also joined several Facebook groups about RVing and traveling by vehicle through Mexico. That was a really great way to see if there were increased incidences in any area or if any fellow travelers had tips for routes to take or things to be aware of and when we were heading to a new destination. They're free to join and they are a great resource. Generally speaking, tourists aren't targeted for things other than that might be opportunistic petty crimes like theft. We did have someone steal 500 pesos from our cenote because we left our backpack and our wallet out when we were swimming. That was our bad. We shouldn't have done that whether we were in the US on a public beach in Miami or St. Petersburg or in Mexico. So we made ourselves available to a crime and sadly it happened. When it comes to serious crimes though, I really don't think they're targeting tourists as much. It could cause major international relation issues and it also would minimize tourism, which is a huge part of Mexico's economy. Yes, cartels exist. Yes, cartels are violent. Yes, cartels do terrible things, unfortunately, more, more often to Mexican nationals. Something to be aware of, but not necessarily fearful of so much of the fact that you're just never going to experience the country because that's sad. Mm -hmm. We also want to mention that our experience driving and traveling through Mexico is coming from a white tourist perspective. We understand that people of color, especially someone who may look Hispanic, maybe they are black, or a Mexican national may have very different experiences. I know a lot of crime is targeted toward Mexican nationals, so the threat of traveling throughout may be higher for you depending on who you are. So we can only speak to our experience and we suggest that you seek out alternative resources to find out more. There are some great channels of black creators who are living here in Mexico and really enjoying it. They share things like concerns over safety and racism as well in Mexico. And there are definitely Mexican nationals doing great travel vlogs throughout Mexico that can speak to that on a deeper level. 
This is our experience. And in the comments below, please make sure that you're not fear-mongering about Mexico. And if you do have an experience you think would be helpful for others, make sure it's a first-hand experience. We can't tell you how many people said they've heard about this or what about this. And a lot of times you don't know the full story of what's happening behind it. And it's really important to only share your own personal experience to help inform and educate others. Traveling through the country in an RV as a tourist, you're much more likely to experience corrupt cops then you are an interaction with the cartel. Unfortunately, police corruption is a very real part of Mexico and has a long and complicated history for the country. We experienced our first run-in with a corrupt police officer in Acapulco. It's been a very controversial video and topic. And we wanna just emphasize that it's not isolated to any one area. A lot of people said we shouldn't have traveled to Acapulco and that we should have known better and that it was known for this area, but honestly, corruption in the police system can be found throughout all of Mexico. And it's not uncommon for you to get pulled over for an infraction you may or may not have done. And the police officer will allow you or ask you to settle it for a small fee right then and there without a ticket. If you're able to speak Spanish and translate and communicate with the police officers, make sure that you're actually getting pulled over for a real infraction. Ask to see the citation that shows that what you just did was illegal. You also shouldn't give them your real license. It's a good idea to have a photocopy and that's what you hand the officer and you will be able to show them your physical real one through the window, they'll have the copy and that way they can't hold your license ransom like they did with us. It also is a good idea to film the experience. I wouldn't suggest just whipping your phone out or your GoPro out and sticking it in their face, but having something mounted to your dash, like a dash cam, that way they can see it. And we've had officers ask us like, hey, is your camera on? And we're like, mm -hmm, it sure is. And then they usually act a little bit differently, especially if they had ill intention stepping up to the car. If you did make a real infraction and you are at fault, go to the station. If you do find yourself in a corruption uh, situation and they're extorting you, make sure you get the number off of their car. They're not gonna have a badge, they're not gonna have their number or their name on their placard anywhere. So you have to get the number of their car because that's how, um, if you do decide to report it, which there are various ways through each state, so you'll have to Google you know, how to report it wherever you are, but you're gonna need the number on the car. So many of you commented in our Acapulco videos that the current president is making great strides to try and end police corruption, and they've created new ways for you to be able to report police corruption. It will have different resources for numbers you can call and websites that you can report any experiences that you may have. But don't pay if you find yourself in that circumstance Many times it's easier just to make the situation go away. They'll put a lot of pressure on you and it's not fun, but ultimately paying just perpetuates a corrupt system and it's not the way to go. Now with that said, we don't want to make it sound like every police officer in the entire country of Mexico is out to extort money from you. We didn't have a single bad experience with the police until the last week we were there and we were in the country for 11 months. That's saying something. The last expectation we want to discuss today is not one we can set for you, but it's more one you have to set for yourself. International travel is not for everyone. People who are looking for the same or looking for comfort or looking for ease should probably just stay in their home country. But if you're open to new experiences, to new way of doing things, and to accepting things as they are in other countries, not wishing things were how they are where you're from, then international travel, especially travel to Mexico, is amazing. To us, travel is about experiencing new things, meeting new people, and seeing how things can be done differently. Our job as visitors is not to cast judgment, it's not to compare, and it's not to wish things were being done differently. Of course, there are things that we didn't exactly love as we were visiting Mexico. For example, there's tons of litter everywhere. There's literally trash on the beaches, on the highways, and all across the cities. And while that was really hard for us to kind of understand why that would be, especially in such beautiful places, when we dug deeper and tried to understand, we realized it's because they're a developing country and they're responsible for reducing and getting rid of their own waste. We've realized that this is not just an isolated Mexico problem. This is a 
every country across the globe problem because in a lot of rural areas there's infrastructure to bring the stuff to the place but no one cares about getting rid of the waste so it has to go somewhere and if you're a local guy who's building his own house that's supporting a family there and you're using all of these products but you don't have a dump to take it to where is it going to go it's going to go on the side of the road or you're going to pile it up and eventually burn it and some of that is going to obviously blow in the breeze or get dropped in the lake or in the ocean there's also a lot of noise in mexico <laughs> they are definitely enjoy their music as they're working they love fireworks literally any time of day and any day <laughs> anyone that's selling something often goes by on a car it can be a truck or a little motorcycle or a bicycle and it'll have like a microphone that's screaming or singing what they have to sell in the area to let you know they've arrived and there's lots of dogs stray dogs is a huge problem in Mexico. That's not the top priority for dealing with issues in Mexico. They have other things that they're more concerned about and understandably so, but for someone who might have a soft spot for pets in general, especially dogs, it can be really challenging to see some of these stray dogs, especially when they look malnourished. It, it can be hard. We've seen dog lovers that have traveled through Mexico carry bags of dog food and if they see one that looks like it could use a meal they'll just kind of sprinkle some out on the side of the road so that's something that you can definitely do if you are a pet lover people are also trying to sell you something everywhere it seems like everything is for sale in mexico if you just ask the right questions or speak to the right person they and call them callejeros and they're everywhere like whether they're selling gum or some kind of trinket or trying to get you to go on a tour that's in the town they're all like super salesmen. They're trying to get your attention. Hey, 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 come over here, talk to me, look at this. And that's just something that they all do. It so is. you kind of have to get over it and just a simple gracias, like thank you, and just continue to walk and don't even take the conversation past that is not rude. In the Yucatan Peninsula, we noticed it was extra intense just because of the amount of tourists they get each year, but it's how they sell. So with all that said, we are not just trying to highlight negatives about Mexico. We are just trying to bring you awareness of things that you need to set expectations in your mind for before arriving to Mexico and traveling in your RV or whatever means you decide to drive through the country in. Mexico is not built for RVs and you're coming here with an RV trying to travel in a country that doesn't necessarily have the infrastructure for RVs. That has challenges with it but it also has huge rewards. If you're willing to do the extra work, if you're willing to do the extra planning, and you come here with an open heart, an open mind, and an open belly, you will be rewarded. It's so awesome. I described traveling through Mexico like a roller coaster. It's thrilling, it's nerve wracking, but it's fun. So, you know, every travel day, it was, you start the travel day and it was just like stress, 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 stress. And then you get to the destination, you're like, oh yeah, this is why I came here. And everything is awesome. So you just kind of have to, you just gotta know what to expect, which is exactly what we're trying to do here. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. We'd love to hear your comments or reflections on the video or if there's any questions we didn't answer. And if you would like more information, especially in a concise, beautiful, downloadable form, we do have our 70-page RV to Mexico guide. It walks you through all the things you need to prepare your RV, equipment to bring, how to cross the border, including paperwork and requirements for your vehicle as you enter. It also covers everything about traveling throughout the country and our personalized map that we use to help us plan our route with over 100 destinations. If you're interested in that, we'll have a link in the description of the video below and pop up on a card here. But for now, we will see you next week as we release our epic summer travel plans and tell you where we're gonna be going on our next big Eat CRV adventure. I'll see you next week. Next up is fuel. We got a lot of questions about how we were able to find ultra low so ultra. That's we, so hard to I say. I know, it's so hard to say, it's a mouthful. We got a ton of questions about how we were able to find USDL, ultra no, USLD, USLD. Ultra low, ultra, Sulfur. ultra. U L S D. U S L ultra. No, U S U L S D. Yeah. U S L D. Ultra low. It's not U S.